Well, good evening and welcome to another Wednesday's Word. Uh, glad that you've tuned in today to be able to hear a word from the Word. And uh, I'll be starting uh, this series on uh, 1 Corinthians 13. So if you have your Bibles, if you'll turn to that. Uh, I want to be able to walk through this chapter little by little uh, each week that uh, I have the opportunity. Uh, I've entitled this series love in action uh, because that's really what this passage tells us and teaches us about what love really is uh, when we look at this uh, we know that the author was paul he wrote it obviously under inspiration of the holy spirit he wrote it to the church at corinth and we've got to look at the background uh, on this particular book and this particular passage uh, this church the church at corinth um, they, they had spiritual gifts, and they had, for the most part, uh, right doctrine, but they did not have love. Uh, we see divisions, we see lawsuits, we see selfishness, uh, we see abuse of spiritual gifts. Uh, all these things that, that were part of this church at Corinth uh, where love was absent, and Paul's having to address that here in this passage which uh, he, he does and tells us really what love really is in action. You know, the Bible says a lot about love. It's men mentioned uh, probably about 350 times throughout the Bible. It's so central. Matter of fact, there's the passage, God is love. That's how crucial love is because that's the description given of God himself, that he is love. You know, William Barclay made this quote. He said, for many, this is the most wonderful chapter in the whole New Testament. John MacArthur said, in quotes, the greatest passage Paul ever penned. Well, that's some pretty amazing statements about this passage, but it is that impactful for as we study it. You know, a lot of people have said, love doesn't make the world go around, but it sure makes it a more pleasant trip. And that's true because love is what we all need, what we all need to give, what we all like to receive, and how important it is for us to learn more about love. You know, you don't necessarily think about learning how to love. You think it, well, it just kind of comes naturally, but it really doesn't. Matter of fact, I believe that love is one of the most misunderstood words um, in the entire language. I mean, we say, we love our dog, we love our new phone, uh, we love our house, we, we may love our career, we love a particular hobby, we love our spouse. Uh, hopefully th that's not the same mindset on each of those when you mention that word love because that carries a whole different connotation on each one of those, but we just have that one word. And we'll be looking at the various words for love in the scriptures of how the Greek focuses now on a particular word that we're going to be talking about here, which is agape. You know, the, uh, the definitions that we see about love are kind of distorted from what the Bible says. From uh, the yourdictionary.com defines love as a strong affection for a person or thing. Uh, Merriam-Webster's Collegiate Dictionary defines it as a strong affection for another. Uh, Wikipedia defines it as any of a number of emotion and experiences related to a sense of strong affection. You know, all of that affection, emotions, all of that, and those are aspects of love, but that's not the basis, the, the true definition of what the Bible says is love. Uh, that's where really the world comes out and says it, it is those affections and emotions. And and rightfully so, that uh, we want our love to uh, generate affections and emotions, but sometimes it doesn't because love is not uh, generated by l emotions and feelings. And we'll discuss that even further uh, in just a moment. You know, it's amazing. They, they did a, some researchers did a uh, study where they uh, proposed a question to four to eight year olds. And the question was, what does love mean? And uh, I'm not going to read them all, but here's just a few of them I thought were interesting just looking at how children view love. 
This was Rebecca, age eight. When my grandmother got arthritis, she couldn't bend over and paint her toenails anymore. So my grandfather does it for her all the time, even when his hands got arthritis too. <laughs> and then she says, that's love. You know, Danny, age seven, says, love is when my mommy makes coffee for my daddy and she takes a sip before she gives it to him to make sure it tastes okay. Chrissy, age six, says, love is when you go out to eat and give somebody most of your french fries without, giving, without making them give you any of theirs. You know, theirs is closer definition than those others because they all involve sacrificing for the good of someone else. And that's what we want to look at first before we even go into this passage of a few supporting scriptures to kind of give us the mindset before we even start on this 1 Corinthians 13. First of all, the Bible says that the basis of love is really a commandment or an action, not a feeling. You know, when Jesus was asked by the lawyer, what's the greatest commandment? You know, Jesus spelled it out. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. And then he said, this is the greatest and foremost commandment. And the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. So loving God and loving others is the foremost of the commandments because that really boils down the Ten Commandments. The, the first four are about loving God. The last six are about loving others. And that's, that's the basis. If you love God and you love other people, uh, that's, that fulfills, that's, that's, that's our focus on what we want to do uh, is, is loving. Uh, Jesus said in John 15, 12, this is my commandment that you love one another just as I've loved you. In 1 John 3, 23, it says, this is his commandment that we believe in the name of his son, Jesus Christ, and love one another just as he commanded us. You see, those are commands. That's an action. Uh, the basis is not the feeling. The basis is the commandment. You know, you, I have people that tell me in my office and counsel, you know, I, I don't love them anymore. I don't feel any love for them anymore. Uh, the feelings of love are gone. And, uh, you know, the, the point is what we're learning here is love is an action, a commandment. We're commanded to love. And then... We do hope and pray that many times that the feelings or emotions or affections come along. I've heard it illustrated before like a train. A train has an engine, a train has a bunch of cars in the middle, and, an, and a train has, or it used to at least, have a caboose at the end. Uh, the train is our will, uh, the caboose is feelings, and if we can't, the train can't move by the the, by the caboose. It has no uh, ability to pull the train, but the engine can. So the engine is our will. And as we go and say, this is what we need to do. These are the actions I need to take of love. Prayerfully, as the engine pulls the cars across, eventually feelings will come that way. And so we need to focus on the action, not the feelings of love to be able to accomplish what God wants us to do. Because love has to do with sacrificing for the good of someone else, whether our feelings dictate that or not. You know, there's various words in the Greek for um, love, uh, eros having to do with romantic or sexual love, sorge, which has to do with family or parental love, uh, uh, philae, which has to do with close friendship or brotherly love, where we get the word Philadelphia. Or, um, and then there's agape, which is this love spoken of, which has to do with the kind of love that God shows, that sacrificial, that unselfish love that we have for other people, not based on their performance, but based on our actions toward them. You know, you can easily see that definition in John 5, 13. Greater love has no one than this that one lay down his life for his friends. What was the deal? No greater love 
then you could lay it. Because why? Because that's the greatest sacrifice. That's the most one can sacrifice for somebody else is to lay down their life for them. So the greater the sacrifice, the greater the love. You know, for God so loved, according to John 3, 16, that he gave. He gave his son because love is sacrificing for the good of somebody else. God gave his son as a sacrifice for us so that we could have salvation and be able to gain heaven and be with him. And so we can see even in that that uh, love demands sacrifice. Jesus said in Matthew 5, 46, For if you love those who love you, what reward do you have? Do not even the tax collectors do the same? I mean, he was saying everybody loves those that love them. I mean, that's easy. But what about loving those that don't love you or that don't show you love? Can you sacrifice for them? Can you show them love? Well, that kind of love comes uh, from God uh, for us to be able to show that kind of love toward others. Matter of fact, the Bible says in 1 John 4, 19, we love because he first loved us. That's the only way we can really love others is because we realize Christ loved us first and that God poured out his love toward us. Why? Even while we were yet sinners. You know, that's what's amazing about it. While we were yet sinners, we didn't have to measure up. Christ loved us just the way we were in our sin. And he loves us now, even with our faults. His love is so unconditional. And we are to have that kind of love for other people. We're to be the conduit where God's love goes through us to others. 1 John 4, 7 said, Beloved, let us love one another, for love is from God. And everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. See, we're that conduit that we take God's love and receive it, and then we can give it to other people the way we received it from God. It, uh, Romans 5, 5 says, The love of God has been poured out into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who he's given to us. So it's poured in, and then it pours out to other people. Uh, it's kind of like, uh, you know, the Dead Sea. You know, uh, water goes into the Dead Sea, but water doesn't go out of the Dead Sea, and everything in that sea is, obviously by the name, dead. You know, there's no giving, only receiving. And we should receive the love of God and give the love of God. Matter of fact, even of the list of the fruit of the Spirit, the first one is uh, the fruit listed first is love because it's primary to do all the rest of those uh, that are listed. And the first one is love. And so, matter of fact, he says, a new commandment I give you that you love one another even as I've loved you that you love one another. This is John 13, 34, and 35. By this, all men will know that you're my disciples if you have love for one another. That's how the world knows that we're Christ's followers is the love that we share toward other people. And so we want to look now at uh, that first verse in 1 Corinthians as we got to that kind of introduction about love and its importance and and, and why we need to really focus on love and how crucial it is in our Christian life that we show the right kind of love. But we need to learn what, what is love. How do we know that we are loving? What does it look like? And he begins in 1 Corinthians 13, 1 by saying, If I speak with the tongues of men and angels, but do not have love, I have become a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. You know, it says here, the tongues of men or angels. We, we have, you know, every time angels speak in the Bible, they're speaking the language of the people that are hearing it. And so further study of this tongues of men and tongues of angels uh, basically has to do with excellence of speech. In other words, it doesn't matter how excellent I may speak uh, and maybe get my words just right and have everything and illustrations and just be the greatest speaker. If I don't have love, if I'm not motivate, motivated by what I'm saying or doing by love, then I'm just making a lot of noise. That's what these pagans used to do that Paul's referring to, these noisy gongs and clanging cymbals. They used to make a, 
a lot of noise during these pagan ceremonies and kind of the louder the noise, the better. But it was just noise because there's only one true God and that's our God. These pagan gods were not gods. They, they would just make these clanging sounds, just making a bunch of noise. And that's what, if you have excellent speech and great delivery, but you don't have love, just make a lot of noise, but no benefit. You know, it says in the second verse there, and if I have the gift of prophecy, that's really preaching, and know all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have all faith so as to remove mountains and do not have love, I'm nothing. I'm nothing. What's that? All mysteries. That's all spiritual knowledge and then all human knowledge. I've got all the knowledge to possess it. Obviously, only God has all the knowledge, but if I possess all this human and spiritual knowledge and I have all kind of faith, in other words, I've got great faith that he can remove mountains, which are difficulties, and I have that kind of faith, but I don't have love that I'm nothing. And then in, first, in the third verse there it says, And if I give all my possessions to feed the poor, and if I surrender my body to be burned and do not have love, it profits me nothing. What is he saying there? I give away all that I have, all my possessions, so that the, the poor could be fed. And I become even a martyr for the faith to be burned. But I don't have love. It's not generated by love. That's not my motivation for doing all these things. It may be selfishness. It may be pride. It may be ego. It may be what others think about me. But if it's not motivated by love, it profits me nothing. Did you catch how both of those ended? The first one, if I don't have love, I am nothing. The other one, if I don't uh, have love, it profits me nothing. <laughs> and so really, that sums up really love math. Uh, if you look at both of those, it kind of ends up with this. Everything minus love is nothing. So if we have all these things, but we don't have love, it equals nothing. It's of no profit. And so that's why it's so important that we study what love really is. And that's what we get to in verse 4, which we'll cover the next time. But I wanted all of us to see how important it was in our life that love, how important it is, and how important it is as we look into this study to know what it is so that we know we're loving other people the biblical way. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for these passages that you give us of how important it is to love, to love others with the love we've been received from you that we can give other people. So, Father, we want to focus, uh, Lord, on how we can do that, how we can show love to those around us, and they will know that we're your disciples by the way we love others. Father, thank you. We praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. I'm glad that you joined us. Uh, we just uh, look forward to as we kick back uh, into verse 4 later, and we'll be... Uh, uh, getting into that as well. But just want to remind you about our uh, regathering Sunday again. That's going to be on uh, Sunday, September the 13th, where we're inviting everybody that's in good health to regather, to come back in person, and we'll have a great celebration there. So be sure you have that down on your calendars. Uh, as we mentioned before, even though we have some limitations in various areas, continue to reach out and minister to other people to show the love of Christ, not only to those in our fellowship, to those that you come in contact round about you, your neighbors, your friends, co-workers, people that you're around. Uh, continue to reach out to them, find their needs, pray with them, check on them. Uh, as we show the love of Christ to other people, uh, we just can't overemphasize uh, how much that means. You know how much it means to you when people pour out love to you uh, give that to somebody else and let them feel that same way. God bless you. Good to come to you today and look forward to seeing you soon. God bless you.